All right, looks like we are on. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Arne, and this is my uh, colleague Steven, and we are very happy to uh, be here today. Uh, we work for a company uh, called For Each, uh, which is based uh, just about a mile uh, from here, uh, and we uh, build custom web applications. Uh, what we mean by a custom web application, it could be anything going from a set of microservices, a CRUD application, a more complex platform for multiple uh, sites, but basically anything that does not really fit with your out-of-the-box CMS things, um, that needs some uh, serious coding but has the web as a, a, a common uh, denominator. Um, we've been doing so for many years and a large part of our company, um, uh, we use the Spring ecosystem to uh, build those uh, applications. Now, um, throughout the years, when you build a lot of custom uh, projects for uh, customers, you notice that there's uh, often the same things uh, that you need, uh, usually side features. Um, so, uh, after a while, we uh, started building our own modules on top of uh, Spring Framework. Um, and uh, we, after a while, we decided, uh, because they were really helping us out internally to, to get stuff done, um, but we're not in the business of creating commercial products. So uh, we decided to open source them and put them available for free uh, for everybody who wants to uh, use them. Um, and we've uh, published them or we published them uh, under the name uh, Across. So um, they've been really helpful to us and we want to uh, give a small illustration in what, part they, in what parts they've been helping us out. Uh, and we want to do that uh, today in this uh, live coding session. Um, what we want to show is we want to show you how uh, some of the modules help us tackle two typical uh, challenges that we occur in um, larger, uh, some of the larger applications that we make. The first one is um, creating an administration user interface for your domain model but really especially in um, applications where actually the administration user interface or the effort for the administration user interface is secondary. Like the focus of the application might really be on the domain model and on building a solid uh, API uh, that goes out there. Um, but uh, sometimes it might also have to do with timing um, because in the beginning of the project, we create the entities, we create the domain, and we start really focusing on the API because that's what we need to integrate with different partners. So there's really not much time for uh, an admin UI, uh, but we still need something quite often, right? So what happens is often we end up with something like this. I'm sure that uh, we've all seen this. And by the way, this is not a fake. This is actually a, a front-end form that was created that we use on our booth during the DevOps. Uh, and to be fair, it's not even that bad, right? The, the text boxes have placeholders and the labels were clickable and things like that. But still, it's not really um, I, an ideal admin UI, not really something you can uh, confront your users uh, with. It's not very high quality or user friendly. So we, we have better ways to uh, deal with that. Um, and uh, a second challenge that we, wanna, uh, we often encounter and that we want to illustrate today is um, the problem of adding some basic web CMS features uh, to a web app. But again, when uh, the web app itself is really not about uh, basic standard CMS functionality, it might be a completely custom uh, product catalog where almost all the data uh, comes from uh, different systems, services, whatnot, but they, like you have that, um, and you have a very nice front end, but then still, towards the end of the project, maybe somebody from legal comes by and says, oh yeah, by the way, in the footer, we need like a legal notice link, and there needs to be a page behind that, uh, and, and marketing says, oh yeah, we need a contact page, of course, it's still a website, right? Uh, so we need a contact page, um, so can you add that? So what happens then often, because since it's so like uh, not really the focus of the project, uh, it tends to get forgotten. Um, and the result is usually then, if you're lucky, the developers create like a small system where you can have text boxes and you can uh, part, uh, paste your HTML code uh, in there. Um, if you're unlucky, uh, it actually gets added in the template. 
and it can only be changed upon a deploy, which really costs developer time, in fact. Uh, and that's not something uh, we like. So we really want to show you how uh, we got a lot of help uh, and, and use a different way of approaching these. And of course, we want to illustrate how we use these across modules um, to do that. So the rest of this presentation will be uh, live coding, right? Um, what we'll be passing by is um, some mainly Spring stuff, some Spring MVC, some Spring data, some JPA, uh, and a bit of time leaf templating, which we uh, very much prefer. None of that in depth, um, and we will not really take time to explain uh, a lot of things, but I hope everybody can uh, follow. Even more, if you have your laptop and you feel like it and you're a fast typer, you can keep up with certain snippets. There's not too many. You can code along. We'll use a starting point actually online um, to get started. Um, because uh, I'm going to glance over a whole lot of details um, during this talk because we have a limited amount of time and I really just want to illustrate how we practically use it. But there's a website which we'll use as a starting point um, where you can find all the documentation and a whole lot more uh, of uh, details on how it works and how you can uh, use it. So let's go to the uh, coding. And since I'm not a very good coder, I'll hand the keyboard uh, over to my colleague, Steven. He doesn't talk much. It's better that way. <laughs> OK, so this is the, if, yeah, you, you probably need to drag it to that screen. So this is the website, across.foreach.be, and we'll actually start from there. There's a Get Started button um, at the top, because like all the cool kids in town, if you know Start Spring I.O., we also have an, uh, an app uh, initializer which helps us generate a uh, project. Um, so um, what this does is we configure a project. We name the project DevOps, and we're just going to add some modules to create a starting application which we'll build upon. So let's add uh, web, across web support. We want to build, uh, yeah, we want to add a message source. Um, we want to sample at this point the administration UI, so we're going to add an admin web module which gives us a basic uh, uh, secured section. Um, I want to have some sample entities, so I'm going to add an entity manager with some example entities. These are the ones we'll build upon. And I want to add the entity module. And that's it. We're generating the project. So what this does, um, if you're familiar with Start Spring IO, basically the same principle. It, yeah, this is probably going to take a little bit longer because the screen swi switching, which we didn't take into account. But um, this actually gives us a zip file containing a Maven project. Um, uh, it, uh, it's configured as a Spring Boot application, and the cross application runs as a Spring Boot application. Um, so uh, all Stephen is doing now uh, is unzipping uh, that zip file, and he is going to import it in... Uh, IntelliJ, which is everybody's favorite IDE nowadays, it, uh, it seems. So while that is uh, importing, we'll have a, a very quick glance at the project structure first. So what we got here, uh, depending on the settings I checked, right, some code got added, and I uh, added some sample code. When we add some sample code, uh, we add some additional comments explaining uh, certain things. So the important thing for um, this uh, talk is the sample code has added a simple blog domain, right, with two entities, a blog entity and an author, and the blog is written by an author. Um, so if we look at the author entity, it's really a, a simple, very simple JPA entity. There's some Lombok annotations that we um, use. Um, and the author repository is a, a Spring Data JPA repository. Right? The whole setup comes with a, a local H2 database when we are uh, developing. So this is the stuff we're actually going to uh, work on. Um, the most important part of the application itself is like the, cen the central DevOps application class. People familiar with Spring Boot will uh, recognize this uh, right away uh, because it's not really a Spring Boot application. It's an across application that runs as a Spring Boot application. Important thing here is we can see those modules that we uh, selected. We can see some of those uh, here. So um, let's start up the application. 
Now, when starting in a cross application, the first thing you always want to do is enable the dev uh, spring profile uh, because that activates development mode. Um, development mode does things like automatic resource uh, reloading, templates, uh, integrates with Spring, Dev, Spring Boot Dev tools, but it also allows other modules to um, like provide developer-oriented uh, functions if they uh, if they want to do that. So we're starting up the application. The first time it takes a, a little bit more time because the local database gets created um, because the example code also adds some uh, inserts some sample entities. So we're started. Why don't we go to localhost 8080? There's an embedded Tomcat in there, like uh, the default with Spring Boot applications. So the Tomcat gives us a 404, which is normal. We didn't add any front-end controllers. But we, uh, we're simulating a CRUD application. In this case, uh, we did add admin web. So um, admin web, by default, configures a secured section under the path slash admin, which is configurable. So that's great. And here we can log in with a, a very uh, secure username and password admin admin which is configured in the example uh, configuration so we don't go to production like that so when logged in uh, we see that there's stuff in our admin um, already um, we have the orange here it's yellow orange uh, developer tools that's an example of entity module um, uh, providing extra functionality if development mode is uh, enabled. It allows us to debug uh, certain things. And then we have this uh, menu called Entity Management, um, and there we have uh, an author and a blog post section. So if we click on author, what we see here is the imported authors from the sample data. If we click on blog post, we actually see the uh, blog posts. If we do create a blog post, we get a form for creating a blog post where we can uh, add an author uh, like that. Now, um, again, I'm going to glance over a whole lot of details. Pretty much everything can be changed, but I really want to show some specifics. Um, so let's assume that we have this model of a blog post and an uh, author. We have that. It's maybe from a different library. Even we can't touch those uh, entities. Um, we have them in our application. But um, in our small blogging engine, we want to. Uh, um, we have a particular case. We have a blogging engine, um, and. Uh, we're going to have guest authors. Now, unfortunately, they don't work for free. They are going to send invoices. And I really want to be able to manage those invoices in this system uh, so I can see the relationship between the author and the invoice. So let's add a small invoice entity um, to our domain. So we're going to the code, and uh, we're just going to add a package called invoice. Um, and we're going to add two things, an invoice entity and a Spring Data repository for it. So if the god of snippets is with us, this should go pretty quickly. There we go. So all we do is we create a new uh, entity. The add data annotation is Lombok, creates getters, setters, things like uh, that. So an invoice has a unique ID. It is from an author that sent the invoice, and it is for a, a particular blog post. We have received it at a certain date, and of course, there's an amount of money uh, that is being invoiced. And we can give an invoice a status. Uh, I never uh, refuse invoices, so uh, we received, uh, we approved them, or we actually paid them. Uh, optionally, we can also add uh, a note, an additional description, uh, whatnot. That's a, a simple entity. The two things special about this entity is that it's implementing the persistable interface, which is basically required to uh, use the Spring Data uh, JPA repository. Um, so that's something from Spring Data. Um, and the second thing is that we added the custom get label method that uh, generates a more simple descriptive uh, label invoice uh, get ID. That's it, simple entity. Uh, we still need repository. So let's add our invoice repository, which as well is nothing more but uh, your basic uh, Spring Data JPA repository. Nothing special about it. It imp ex implements uh, JPA repository and JPA specification executor for defining custom uh, queries, if you would so like, um, and a silly method that counts all the invoices by author which we'll use uh, uh, later on in this example. So that's it. Um, 
Uh, uh, we've created our entity. Now, uh, we don't want to be busy with defining a schema right now. The other schema was installed through uh, Liquibase. Uh, so we're just going to change the setting on uh, Hibernate, uh, uh, adding that Hibernate should actually update the schema automatically upon restart. All right, and, uh, and now we can uh, probably just recompile, and the application should get restarted because Spring Boot DevTools is uh, active. Okay, great. Application restarted. Let's uh, refresh the interface. And now we see we have an invoice menu option uh, as well, which is giving an exception. It is a demo. Let's scroll down. There is no, uh, there is no backup plan. Uh, ah, the, the typo in the Hibernate property, okay. All right, now we need to restart, I think, because, oh no, it detects the changes. <laughs> All right. But we already saw uh, that um, the entity got uh, picked up and is in the user inter interface. Now it is working. Uh, let's see if we can actually create a new invoice. And we see immediately that we get a form where we can already select the author, author is required, blog post is required, let's create uh, an invoice from the across team for, for a certain uh, blog post, add a date, add some money, set status, and add a big blob of text as a note. And this will work. So what actually happens is uh, that one module, the entity module that we added to our system, um, it uh, inspects, uh, it builds a meta model for entities with uh, a default uh, implementation that inspects Spring data repositories. Um, so this could in fact be like a MongoDB repository or another type of Spring data, data repository. Um, it tries to uh, find the entities from that, builds an entity a meta model, and based on that meta model is going to try to generate a user uh, interface for you. We've added the invoice. If we go to the list, then we see the invoice there. And what's also uh, interesting to know is if we go to um, author, for example, and we added one for the across team, we see author now has a top invoices where we can see the invoices attached to that uh, author. Now this is, um, again, the relationship is detected based on the types, the class types. Um, it can do the automatic filtering because it detects that there's a repository that implements JPA specification, executor is mapped um, to entity module stuff, and that works. So, but let's have a, a, a look at the form, and uh, because I think we want to add a little bit of customization to that. I see author and blog post are required, um, but um, receive date is not. That's okay, but the amount of money I will always need. We, we need to make that one required, and I think status is also required, and, and status can never be null. So I really want the default um, value uh, on status. So let's see how we can change that. And as first step, let's go back to our entity, right? Because if we look at our entity, um, we noticed that it has two not null annotations, which has uh, been validation annotations, um, on author and blog post. And these were actually inspected to determine that the control should be uh, not only rendered as a uh, required uh, value, uh, but also actually behave as if a value is required, meaning it doesn't offer the option to enter an empty value. Um, so if we add a not null on um, our amount and on our status, then they will become required. Also status, I would like a default value, which just makes sense, right? Um, and just to show you bean validation, uh, let's say I am uh, not very good at business and I do not... Uh, uh, I only want actual invoices uh, to receive invoices that I need to pay. I don't want to receive credit notes, so the amount needs to be at least zero or more. Right. Now there's one more thing, just to illustrate how annotations can make a difference. Um, if we go quickly back to the uh, form, if we select a date, we can see that there's actually a date and timestamp there. 
But that does not make much sense. I'm really only interested in uh, knowing at what date I received the invoice. Um, so uh, I don't even want to persist the timestamp in the database, so I'll, I'll add the temporal annotation from Javax Persistence. So with that, we can actually tell the entity manager that it should uh, only persist the date. So what we did now is we added some annotations. If we simply recompile and reload, uh, uh, go back to our form. Yeah, I think it's already uh, done. So now we see a difference, right? We see that amount is required, status uh, is required, and pre-filled with received. And if we select receive date, we can see that there's no more timestamp uh, because those annotations were inspected um, to uh, determine how the control should be rendered. If we, let's say, let we try to create a new for uh, different author, different blog post, and, and different amount of money, why not? Okay, if let's put the amount now, try to save it with the amount negative. No, that's not going to work. Well, that, that, that would not going to work, but that's going to give a different uh, exception, right? So we see that also the minimal validation um, is done. The validation is actually done by the annotations. Um, it just uh, hooks up with the default uh, annotation validator that uh, uh, Spring provides. So, so far we've customized the behavior of the form and the layout of the form uh, simply by adding sensible annotations to our entity, right? Um, but uh, sometimes you can't change the entity, or you don't want to put pure front-end uh, behavior in your entity. Uh, so there's, there's other ways that we can uh, extend. Let's give a, a, an example. Uh, let's have a look at the amount. Now, amount is, in this case, uh, it's stored as a big decimal. We're going to keep it that way. But um, I know it's always going to be an amount of money in euro, right? So I want to, in the front-end, I always want it to um, behave as a currency. So what we want to say is we want to tell entity module that it should configure the property um, of amount to always in all its forms when it's rendered to display as a currency. So how can we do that? Well, externalizing configuration and changing it, um, we can do by creating uh, a simple spring component, uh, which is usually uh, a configuration class, though it does not really need to be. which um, implements an interface called Entity Configurer. Now, Entity Configurer gives us a single method. Um, it actually gives us access to the Entity's metadata uh, builder, which, and it allows us to change all uh, metadata of all entities. And you can have as many configurers as you want throughout your uh, system, and they can all build on uh, each other. So in this case, what we want to do is we want to change the invoice entity, and we want to um, configure the properties. So when we call properties, we get access to the properties builder consumer. So I want to say we want the property amount, we want to have it uh, um, behave as a currency, and the easiest way to do that is to specify an attribute of currency class with the actual currency values. There's mo more ways to do that. That one is the easiest one. Why does that work? Because the amount is actually a number type, and the default controls for number type will inspect uh, for certain attributes or configurations for the front end, and based on that, determine how they want to uh, display. So we add that, we recompile. If we now go back to the application, to our form, yeah, we'll open new form, we can actually see that is now prefixed with the euro sign. Uh, this is a, a, a custom uh, a jQuery numeric uh, control, so it's really not like we need to uh, enter the euro sign manually in the text box, uh, nor the two uh, decimal um, places. Even more, if we go to list view now, we'll see that there as well, the uh, amount is rendered in exactly the same way. So this is a very externalized uh, a configuration uh, of an entity property. So another example of doing that in a more slightly more specific way, let's have a look at the status, which is now a select box. However, I know there's only going to be three status statuses, so basically it's easier if it's a radio, uh, right? So um, let's turn the status uh, property into a radio. 
uh, in exactly, well, in more or less the same way, we'll um, change another property of the invoice, which is status. And now we want to say, we want to configure um, and the mode, well, it's not attribute in this case, we want to um, specifically for when the status control is being rendered, we want the entity module to generate a different UI component. Now, a UI component in the concept of entity module is called the view element. Um, I think the attribute method needs to be the view element uh, mode. Right. So what we say is the view element type for uh, the control mode should be the um, radio buttons. Now, the bootstrap UI elements radio, that's just a string, that's just a unique identifier. Um, because there's a, another module, Bootstrap UI module, that for certain types of strings will generate Bootstrap compatible markup uh, components. But it, you, it could basically be anything. You can replace uh, the entire layer uh, of the components being generated. If somebody would want to build a Vaden based interface, for example, that should be entirely possible. So if we go back now, we should see, there we go, that we get radio buttons instead, and it's still. If we save, we need to prove that it still works, right? So uh, th these are two ways uh, of the many ways that we can uh, change configuration um, externally. But so far we've done that um, uh, for the entity as a whole. Now let's go to the list view. And let's say that um, I want to change the list view because I notice on this list view that note is being shown, but that might be a big blob of text. I really don't want that one on there. Um, and I can also see that I can sort on the columns. Again, that's something because we implement JPA specification executor in uh, Spring Data, that that works out of the box. Um, but by default, the list view is not sorted. I think it's interesting if it's by default sorted on receive date. So let's customize only the list view. So how can we do that? We go back to our entity configurator. And on the, still on the entity uh, invoice, now we scope to the list view builder. And on the list view builder, we can say show properties. And we want to say, uh, because we're lazy, show all the currently configured properties, which is represented by dot, except the node. Except is with the tilde. So we're saying all the current uh, properties except the node. And we want to apply a default sort on the receive date property. That's it. Let's go back, open a new list view, and we should see that it's sorted by default and note has disappeared from the view. There we go. And we can still sort on other columns. That's not a problem. We just change the defaults of a uh, list view. So we've seen a way of customizing the invoice entity, the entity that we added. But um, we can do a little bit more still. Um, let's say, back to the original proposition, I have my blog entity, I have my author entity, they come from elsewhere, right? I cannot change those entities. However, on the author list view, I'd like to add the phenomenally useful uh, field of seeing how many invoices that there are for that author. So I can't change the entity, I cannot add it on the entity. So what I can do is I can uh, define a fake property on the author uh, entity. So if we, again, entity configure is the uh, starting point, only now uh, we'll, um, we're going to create an entity, uh, sorry, uh, a property, which actually fetches the data of which, how many invoices there are from a different component, in this case, uh, the repository. So how are we going to do that? Well, we, first we're going to scope our entities configuration builder to the author class. And again, we go into the properties. And now we're simply going to define a property with the name representing the number, the total number of invoices, total invoices. And we go and say the uh, property type of that property is an integer, because it's just going to give me a count. And at the, the minimum, uh, if I don't want to configure much, uh, I can just give a value fetcher, which is basically a functional interface giving a uh, um, for the um, author, the uh, value that I want to put there. And in this case, uh, yeah, did you use? Yeah, I think you need to, um, uh, you're not on the snapshot, I think you need to define it the old uh, way. The next release uh, supports the lambdas. Um, 
but there was a in, in this version there's like a typing uh, type inference problem so uh, it should be a, a bit of uglier hacking uh, well syntax wise right okay so same thing we just say value fetcher we get in an author uh, we know it's an author and we return the count so all we did now is we define the property on author. We didn't specify anything more on that property, which means that by default the property is readable, not writable, um, and default list views add all properties um, that are readable, show them by default, unless they are hidden, so but if nothing special, then it shows readable properties. If we go to list view, we now see that the property total invoices, which gets its data from somewhere completely else, um, got added. As the last thing I want to show in this part of the demonstration, um, the label on top, right, that's not very uh, user-friendly. We, we didn't define a display name in code, so it just uses the property name. Luckily, pretty much any label you see, be it the form label, you, description, placeholder, anything, um, comes through uh, message codes. And if you know the message code, you can change any label. And that's uh, documented in the reference documentation. So um, we have a default uh, message source uh, which is configured. We, we selected that. So in this case, our label uh, for the entity is, uh, well, the module where the entity belongs to, and this is called DevOps application module. We want to access an entity. Uh, the entity's name is author. You want to access a property of uh, author, and the property is total invoices. And we want to give it a nicer uh, label. That's it. So um, this is just a glimpse of um, all the possibilities that you have, because you have very limited amount of time, and there's uh, enormous uh, things you can do with it. You can create custom views, hide stuff, uh, add custom controls. Um, but uh, this really helps us in very quickly generating a pretty decent basic user interface and customizing that. Um, it's not, of course, a total tool for the, the, the uh, fully optimized user interface experience. It's not meant for that. Um, but um, because when you need that, you probably have a separate project uh, with time and budget to be able to do that, right? But this uh, entity module uh, really helps us in generating good user interfaces with a very small amount of effort. That's the back end of our blogging engine. Let's see uh, about uh, uh, moving on to the front end side, right? Um, remember the second case, adding some basic web CMS features um, to an application that is uh, you know, not really web CMS focused. So what Steven is doing now, he is uh, just for time's sake, he is switching to a uh, different project he has uh, already prepared, just so we don't have to download and unpack. Um, but what we actually did is we went to generate project again, um, and we select like there's a preset website with custom backend. You just select that one, leave all the samples on and do generate, and then you get this. You, you can see there's uh, some more modules uh, added in there. But if you look at the domain, we will still see, uh, again, our author and blog post, exactly the same. Uh, a difference is there's a, a web uh, package uh, that contains, uh, uh, like, the blog controller. Maybe you can open the blog controller, which is a standard Spring MVC controller, which renders the blog post. And there's some time leaf templates um, for visualizing the output. So let's just start up this, uh, uh, this application. And this time, we will get a a front-end included from the sample code. First startup. All right. Let's go to localhost 8080. There we go, a front end. These are the teasers of our blogs. I believe we can uh, older posts or click through on one. Yep, that's a pretty heavy image, it seems. It comes from the net, but uh, it works. So uh, this is actually a fully functional uh, blog um, application. So this is the, um, the front end, which is nice. Let's have a little look at the back end. Again, admin module is in there, so we get the same type of thing, the same level of security in the example. 
Okay, now we see a couple more um, things, right? Uh, yeah, the, the demo controller is a, an example. Uh, we see in the entity management section, we see a user module got added. That's because we added that one. That, that one provides a simple user domain. We're not going to uh, go deeper in that one. Um, our module is now called, our application module is called differently, simply because we named the application differently, but the entities are exactly the same. And the web CMS module is uh, added. Now, Web CMS module is, uh, well, as the name implies, is a module that provides some basic Web CMS features. Uh, and one of those is a Web Component, which can serve as a simple building blocks for slicing up your templates and making them dynamic. So, for example, let's create a new Web Component. I mean, again, this is not a full-fledged CMS. It's not supposed to be. This is just a module adding some basic features. Let's maybe create an HTML uh, component. Let's call it footer or test footer yeah and we can uh, we get a, a small code mirror um, uh, component which allows us to uh, uh, enter some html with some uh, simple highlighting okay so we created the component basically manageable by the user it's stored in the uh, in the database let's go to the uh, home page and if we look at the footer now let's say how can i get my component to render in the footer instead of that very nice icons. I want my ugly header, right? Um, so um, how can we do that? Well, the footer is part of the layout uh, time leaf template. So let's go to uh, that one. Let's scroll down to the footer. Okay. So here we have the the footer um, markup and. To make it, to turn it into a component, to render the component instead, all we have to do is add an attribute um, and say, the, give it the name of the component. This is because Web CMS module comes with a, a time leaf dialect. We really like time leaf, it comes with a time leaf dialect. Um, and we just say name of the component is test footer. If we refresh the page, we see that our footer has now been replaced by our custom component. On every page, since it's in a uh, the default uh, layout. If we uh, go back to the back end and delete our component, none. then we'll see that we get the original template uh, again, right? Not very practical. It's not very practical if uh, to turn things into dynamic components, we would have to go to the markup, get the snippet out, put it in a script or manually copy it in the admin interface, right? Not very handy. Luckily, we don't have to do that. Um, we can actually get the components auto-created um, upon first render. How do we do that? Well, we go back to the time leaf template and we can add some additional attributes. We're going to say we want this to auto-create this component and we want to uh, auto-create this component as a, a global component shared across all pages. And of course, when we're auto-creating a component, we might want to specify a type of component that should be auto-created, in this case, uh, HTML. That's it. Refresh the page, and we should see nothing has changed. However, if we go to the backend, we get our test footer again. If we edit the footer, we can now actually see that the time leaf markup got processed, and the result of that got imported in our default component. So when I change that, I save, I go back to um, the page, I refresh, I can see that my changes are immediately there. If ever I want to uh, switch back to the original template uh, markup, I can just delete my component and it'll, it will get created uh, again. Of course, global components are only so, so useful. Uh, on my homepage, I have a, a nice hero section, hero section, the large image. Um, with the title uh, above. And I'd want to be able to, to change the hero text. Um, but I only want to be able to uh, do that for this particular page. So basically what I want to do is I want to link components only to a specific page. Now to be able to do that, I can do that, but I need some kind of an entity um, in the backend to which the components can be linked. Luckily, um, WebCMS has basic entities, one of which is a page for obvious reasons. So what we're going to do now is we're just going to create a page record. Um, call it home page, name doesn't matter, not going into many of the details here. Uh, and we are going to map it on the root path of the uh, website. Um, why does it happen this way? Because actually a page can have many, many uh, URLs pointing to the same uh, 
page, which can be useful uh, for SEO purposes. So now we created a page, um, and you can see there's a Web Components tab. We can add components to that page. Um, however, um, let's go to our blog controller. If we look at the home page method, that's still a, 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 a basic spring get mapping, right? So um, there's no, no notice yet, uh, no knowledge of the, uh, the fact that a page needs to be loaded, so the entity doesn't get loaded, so the components could not get uh, detected. So what we can do is uh, we can simply, in this case, replace the uh, get mapping by a web CMS page mapping to the path. Um, by simply doing this, it will work for all HTTP methods, and any URL that points to that page will end up in this handler method. If I were to uh, only want it for post methods, I could just leave an add post ma mapping there. You can combine uh, in many ways. So our controller method now knows that it should load the page uh, entity. Um, we define the page entity, so now we can attach components to them. Right? So if we go to the time leave template, we can go to the hero block and on the side heading, well, we'll declare it as a component. Hero text or something. You know. uh, auto create. In this case, we want to specify an, uh, an attribute called the scope um, because we only want a, a hero uh, text component from attached directly to the page to be taken into consideration because there's a hierarchy. Um, I could define a footer component on my page and it would override the one on the global. Um, so in this case, I don't want that kind of behavior, only if it's attached to the uh, page. And I want to say, let's take a rich text because this is just uh, yeah, heading. And if I refresh, no visual result. However, component has been added um, to the page. Um, and if I make changes, to the title, they will persist immediately. Again, minor changes to the template, um, but no actual immediate uh, visual differences when re-rendering, but uh, uh, win and flexibility for making uh, changes. Now, of course, HTML component, uh, rich text component, uh, they're basically exactly the same. The only difference is how you enter them in the backend. Um, they're only so, so useful. There's another uh, component called container, which is, as the name implies, which allows you to add multiple components and reorder them. Um, so uh, let's put that one to some use as a final example. Um, let's say I want to add, um, I want to be able to add content on the home page at the bottom. So what I want to do is I want to put the header and the main content class inside a container block. Um, so I'm going to uh, create a, a, a custom uh, th block tag, which actually doesn't render um, the tag, only the body of the tag. And I'm going to say that that one is a uh, component of type uh, section positions. Uh, sorry, with the name section positions, and the type is a container. Um, we're going to auto create the component, attach it directly to the page, and there's an additional attribute here parse placeholders. Because the two existing blocks in there, we are now going to define as placeholders. If we have a look at the uh, container, this is actually dynamic time leaf, right? Uh, this iterates uh, uh, over our blog posts, makes decisions, and renders the different teasers. Um, so I cannot make this static. So I am going to uh, both the header, I'm going to add a different tag and say this is a placeholder. There's a, a P too many, I think. Yeah. And I'm going to do the same on the container and say this is a placeholder with a main content or teasers. Or Let's reload the page. I see no difference. If we go to the back end now, I can see that I have a container of section positions. In there, I have two components, header, teasers. Let's add, uh, let's see if we can add an image, right? This image component is also a basic uh, uh, component. In this case, Steven has uh, hooked it up with a, a Cloudinary, an image uh, CDN account. Okay. If I reload the page, I should see my image added at the bottom. And what's really cool about this is, um, I can start shifting the dynamic parts about. 
why don't we try if we can like move the teasers to the top of the page and the header to the bottom. Warning, the result will not be very pretty. Okay. But actually we shifted layout. We've managed to almost make the, the, the entire layout uh, of the home page configurable um, without changing very much of our template, which is really nice in uh, uh, time leaf terms because time leaf uh, very much supports natural templating, which can be quite handy if your uh, designers uh, can, and front enders can work with that. Um, so the, the original template can stay as much as possible in its original state, um, but we can add attributes uh, to actually have sections uh, customizable from uh, a backend. So I uh, hope to give you an illustration uh, of how uh, the entity module can help us quickly generate uh, basic user interfaces with a, a reasonable level of uh, quality and user friendliness. Um, and at the same time, how a web CMS module can uh, help helps us uh, when we need some basic web CMS features in uh, one of our applications, we can simply plug that one in and we get some um, pretty powerful stuff. Uh, of course, uh, most of our things are focused uh, towards developers. Um, so uh, you need to have some technical know-how to set it up. That's very deliberate, but then um, it's pretty user-friendly towards end users uh, uh, from the get-go. So um, I hope this piqued uh, your interest. Um, again, there's a URL across for each e where you can a central starting point, all documentation, full list of uh, um, all possible modules. Um, and uh, yeah, if, if you have any questions, we'll still be uh, down here for a couple of minutes. Uh, and otherwise, I think the floor is open until 8 this evening. So we have a booth on the exhibition floor. It's the one with the racer car, so uh, feel free to drop by there if you uh, have any questions. Thank you. <laughs>